Many of you responded to my comment this morning in the opening messages about the article in Time magazine concerning the plan to build the temple again in Jerusalem. One of the pastors had placed it on my desk while I was away, and I had found in my travels an international uh, edition of Time magazine, which is thinner and doesn't have the advertisements. And then when I got home yesterday, uh, my copy was there. And I have it, and uh, be more than happy to place it on the table, or I guess there's a table out there uh, tonight, and you can look at it. It is quite interesting and fascinating, and that's not the subject of the message tonight. But in rereading it again this afternoon, it is amazing at some of the things that are being said. Of the 65 elements in the ancient temple of David and Solomon, 38 of the elements important for the worship, according to the Old Testament regulation for worship, 38 of those items have already been reconstructed. For instance, the vestments for the priests demand that every thread be a wedding of six different elements. And they show a picture of the priests in waiting. They have already constructed the priestly robes for the worship of the temple. And I re remarked this morning about their search for a heifer. And many of you said, uh, why, why was that so interesting? Let me give you just the paragraph there. One difficulty of restoring the sacrificial worship in the new temple would be the requirement of Numbers 19, 1 to 10, that priests purify their bodies with the cremated ashes of an unblemished red heifer before they enter the temple. Following a go-ahead from the chief rabbinate in Jerusalem, the institute operatives spent two weeks in August scouting Europe for heifer embryos that will shortly be implanted into cows at an Israeli cattle ranch. So they'll not only build this temple, which is a part of biblical prophecy, but they will institute the exact regulation of the entire worship system of the book of Leviticus. One of the paragraphs goes on to say, they point out that animal sacrifices and other aspects of temple worship are so ingrained in Judaism that they take up a third of the 613 biblical commandments plus the major portions of the Talmud and the daily ritual Temple restoration is also a commitment for literal-minded Protestants who deem a new temple the precondition for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Carol thought that I should uh, ask the church to make copies of this article. It is so outstanding. I don't know whether we'll do that or not, but the article is down for you to see tonight. The elements and the increments that suggests to all of us that the Bible has been true and is true and details for us in a general way the preconditions, their word, of the coming of Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus said, When these things begin to come to pass, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. And every generation since the Lord Jesus' ascension have anticipated and hoped for his return. He said, if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am you will be also. And as he was ascending, the apostles recorded that the angels said, in like manner, he will come again. If you take all the words of the Bible and you would string them in one sentence, every 25th word would tell you of the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are more passages in the Bible about the coming of Jesus Christ yet to take place than about the first coming that made possible the gospel in your salvation. So this is not some narrow uh, focus on future event. It is the major predominant theme of biblical prophecy 
concerning the return of Jesus Christ and his reign in the world for a thousand years. And the restoration of the temple for Israel is one of the key elements that many have been looking for for decades, particularly since the founding of Israel. Now, how that will take place, because the spot for the temple to be built is at the identical spot of the Mosque of Omar that you see on television, and how that will be resolved, nobody knows, and that's, of course, part of the article itself. So, when you see war and rumor of war, and when you see pestilence and violence and corruption and perplexity among nations and the inability of the world to solve its problems and domestic uh, disharmony and disobedient to parents and lawlessness. All of these things have to form like pieces in the puzzle, a pattern. It's not one increment more prominent than the other. It is the sequential merging of these uh, major events that caused the church to sit up a little straighter and the heart of the Christian to beat a little faster and the Bible to become more relevant and pertinent and beautiful to know that not only is the promise there for all of us called the blessed hope of the coming of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, but it ought to put an urgency, it ought to bring a great uh, uh, propelling uh, motivation for us to do the work of the gospel and to bring people the saving truth that Jesus Christ is coming again and before he comes that they should welcome him into their hearts and begin to live for him as the salt and the light, as the lights and the corruption seem to become more severe. Read the Bible and then read current events and they will find for you a beautiful wedding. And Paul said of the church in his day, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning the coming of Jesus Christ. So be an alert believer. Don't uh, make a mountain out of a molehill or overemphasize something that is uh, extraneous or a footnote, but be aware of some of these things, particularly when they're presented uh, from a non-Christian viewpoint and yet catching all the increments of the things that would cause believers uh, to be very uh, concerned about and uh, to rejoice in. Just a little footnote to uh, uh, a side comment that I made this morning that evoked in all of you a considerable interest. Thank you for being here tonight. We look forward to the coming days and the first Sunday in November when we will worship for the first time in the sanctuary and then for the other events for dedication and celebration as the near you turns. And the concerts uh, with the uh, orchestra and the choir, and uh, Christmas uh, Eve this year, as you know, is on Sunday evening, and I can't wait until we light all of those candles, and uh, the windows in the sanctuary are reflective, like these are in the back, uh, the color, uh, through those windows as we look at it tonight is just beautiful and all of you will rather see yourselves as you light those candles and that room becomes warm with the love of Christ at Christmas and uh, I saw it the other day I haven't been in the church for a couple of weeks of course because we've been away but um, as you sit there in the sanctuary the lights were on one night it looks as if the pews kind of meet each other in the in the window effect so the room, although it is a little large, will kind of bring us together. It's going to be a beautiful experience. And we look forward to every uh, Sunday night from the 10th, which is the first day of dedication and celebration, on through Easter. And Elizabeth Hanford Dole and uh, the Senator have agreed to schedule one of those Sunday nights to be with us and to be featured in terms of their career and their calling as followers of Jesus Christ. So we'll be announcing the special guests and the special music uh, within, uh, oh, about a month or so as we prepare for the new year. We have a lot ahead of us. We should walk softly before the Lord, seek new humility before his face, and yet work as if it all depends on us. Let's bow again as we pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, take the Word of God now and cause it to come alive as we seek not to just read the Scripture and to hear some interpretation, but as we seek to apply it to our hearts and be the servants for your holy name's sake. Amen. The book of Romans, please, chapter 1. We began this morning uh, a great challenge and uh, a very large task. And it will be my privilege, as I announced this morning, over the many weeks and months to come, to teach from this great commentary of the Bible. It is the, it is the library of the Scripture, all of the revelation of God concerning His plan and purpose in redemption, in and through Jesus Christ to all of us, is found in the book of Romans. It is the commentary of the Bible. It is all that you ever need to know about what God has done, is doing, and will do. And we will seek over these weeks and months to take this book and to really understand it, to look at it historically, intellectually, because it is a very logical book, and yet see it spiritually and devotionally. This morning you were so attentive and helpful and responsive, and I thank you for that. You've been of great encouragement today as we take on this great task of mastering this marvelous book. And our message this morning, as you know, was just the phrase, the gospel of God from Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. I'd like to stay in verse 1 again tonight and conclude our day by focusing on the phrase, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. I'd like to talk about servanthood tonight. I'd like to share with you tonight this very complex, unusual, and typical form in that day which is so unlike and so distant from our society. Our society, particularly in Southeast Charlotte, is measured not by doing for others, but by getting others to do for you. Servants are perceived as being lower than, or less gifted than, or not as educated as, or not quite as qualified as, or those who are limited in skills, maybe because of their race or their background or their training or their environment or something, they have to take a job that is, we would say, less skilled. It's unfortunate that we need to talk that way, but that certainly is true. And so their wage is low, and uh, very seldom do you know their name, and they are to wait on you, they are to serve you, they are to help you. Uh, they are placed in a position in life which is not at the high end. They're not high-scale people. And many of the people that serve us need to hear from us the word of the Lord Jesus, who said, the greatest of all is the person who is the servant of all. And our Lord Jesus Christ is called over 57 times in the Old Testament the servant of God. The word means to minister. Of course, in the day uh, that this was written, in the city of Rome, which was the capital of the world politically and financially, the servant was a slave. He was owned by, 80% of the world was owned by the 20% of the world. The world was in slavery, it was in bondage, it was dictated to by Rome, and people were cheap and inexpensive. The price of a slave was $19.38. 30 pieces of silver, and that was the most you could ever get for a slave. And people had to stand many times almost naked in the marketplace. Their muscles were examined. Their facial uh, strength was looked upon. If they were ugly or lame or in any way injured or scarred or in any way uh, less than, they were cheaper. And people were bought and sold. This word slave becomes a symbol of sin. The bond slave, someone who had no choice, could take no initiative, was marked for life. He was said to be a slave. They could be done away with. You could kill them without impunity. You could sell and buy people. You can imagine this terrible, frightening, and awful symbol. And so this phrase is used of, the early servants of Jesus Christ. Paul says he's a slave. Peter says, I'm a slave. James, the brother of our Lord, said, I'm a brother of the Lord, but I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. 
I'm a slave. The word is doulos. It means to be owned by, to be the possession of someone else. And then if the person that owned you released you or let you go or we would say fired you or gave you your freedom, you of course then were freed. But you were always marked. There was a mark on your face or a hole in your ear. You were always known as being a slave. Then many times the slave could go back to work for the person that owned him originally. And that's the phrase that Paul uses over and over again. Not a slave because I have to be. Not a slave because of coercion. But a slave because lovingly I would like to obey and serve my master. And that's the phrase. Paul doesn't know this congregation. He's never been to Rome. He's never seen their face. He's never ministered to them. He hasn't written a letter to them. He has no step, as it were, to their favor. He just writes them. We assume that they heard about him in all of his travels because Christians did exchange and there were house churches and the information about other churches were passed between the church and the various letters were read in various congregations as quickly as they could be copied because there were no books. So we assume they knew something about him, but he doesn't advance his personal background or his experience to them. He just says, I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. I lovingly serve the Lord Jesus. Out of my heart of adoration for Him and my obligation to Him, I serve Him. That's a great role. You and I may find that the greatest happiness of life comes when we serve Christ. And we sang it tonight. There's joy in serving Jesus, in loving Him and obeying Him. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ wouldn't be a problem, would it? Because we view the Master and we evaluate our Lord with such dignity and grandness. He is God. And yet there were many in that century and many even tonight that don't serve Christ. What is it about us that we know that salvation is free and we've been redeemed but we're not in service? Are you in Christian service? Do all that you do does all that you uh, do, does that really have a canopy over it, an umbrella over it, a banner over it, which is love, that you serve Jesus Christ? Well, this phrase is deep in the text, and we'll just go over a couple of verses tonight. Let's go to chapter 6, for instance. One of the things that uh, is the contrast of this book is that the word servant is used in Many different ways. Chapter 6, for instance, in verse 16. Don't you know that to whom you yield yourself, you are a servant to obey? His servants are you to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The servant's qualification was, was he obedient? The servant was instructed always to keep his eyes upon his master, and many times, just by the master looking at the servant, or by looking into the eye of the servant, the servant would then respond. He was always, as we would say, on his toes. How many times have you and I been in a restaurant, and we would say, can you catch the eye of the waitress? Can you get the waiter to come over? If you spot the waiter, tell him to come. Where is the waiter? Almost as if out of frustration you feel that the obligation of the waiter or the servant is to always be ready to respond to your needs even though in maybe in just the last couple of minutes the person has been waiting on you. But the servant was never to be indolent. He never was to be in any way unavailable. He was always to be there ready to serve and ready to live for the other person. The mark of the servant was obedience. And so Paul teaches the general principle here that the servant is marked by the measure of his obedience. By being a servant, it is incumbent upon him to obey. And what he was saying here also was that we become servants to sin when we sin. And the liberating power of the gospel is to free us from our bondage to sin. We notice this in the next verse. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Notice the tense of the verb. You were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, you become the servants, what's the next phrase, tell me, of righteousness. A transformation of allegiance. A turning 
of obedience from sin and self to Christ and to righteousness. Let no longer your members, the parts of your body, become instruments of unrighteousness, but rather instruments of righteousness to serve God. Paul says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. Don't be a servant of sin. Be a servant of righteousness and be a servant of obedience. Verse 16 is a key word. Now, of course, every one of us has a different charge and a different responsibility. But we need to ask ourselves the question tonight, are we obedient to the Lord? And as I say that, I allow for the Spirit of God to remind us, each in our own way, elements in our lives that we have neglected. What is there that still you haven't yielded to God? I don't know what it is. I seek to probe just for a minute in your conscience. What did you promise the Lord that at this point you still haven't responded to? Maybe at that time you made some decision or some commitment. Maybe you bargained with the Lord. If you'll do that for me, God, I'll do such and such. Have you done the such and such? Have you been obedient to the Lord? Is there any promise that you have made to Him that at this point you haven't kept? A promise, let's say, in witnessing. Maybe during the last months, God has reminded you that you should be a witness for Christ, that you should confess Him openly. How thrilling and freeing it was to hear Elizabeth Hanford Dole tonight speak of the Spirit of God and of the Lord's will in her life. She is unashamed of the gospel of Christ. She a witness, she is a witness to Romans 1.16. Are you as free and open with your talk about the Lord? Wherever you are, whatever you do, whatever your employment is, wherever you have your mark every day, are you openly acknowledging Jesus Christ, not in an obnoxious and annoying way, but freed from fear so that you confess Christ before men, that He will confess you before the Father which is in heaven. Maybe at this point you're not obedient to the witness of Christ. Are you obedient in any other form of service? One of the things we've been saying over the last couple of months is one of the challenges of this congregation is not completing the church. The committee is doing that very well and not even in financing the church. The congregation is doing that very sacrificially. But the responsibility that we have to the people who will visit us, the follow-up system, the 20,000 homes that we will visit in November, we're going to need a thousand of you. We had 600 of you last fall, but we'll need a thousand more who in November will go door to door and share Jesus Christ and create an atmosphere of hospitality in behalf of this congregation. The hundreds of ushers, the workers in the nursery, the additional choir members, all of the responsibilities that we have. You say, I want to serve the Lord. There's so many things that can be done. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And maybe at one time, there was a feeling that you'd like to serve Christ, but you couldn't find your spot. Well, the spot is now open. The applicants can now submit their forms, as it were. There's a lot to do. And you promised the Lord you'd do something, but at this point, all you're doing is sitting and soaking up the Word. You enjoy the teaching, you go to Sunday school, you're blessed by the music, you give in the offering, and you... Almost take Calvary Church for granted. But until you get involved, until you participate, until you move on from being a spectator to a participant, and you serve the Lord, you'll not know the gladness. You'll not know the joy. You'll not know the satisfaction of joining all of those who through the centuries have said, like Paul, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, I live for the moments that I can honor Him in doing for Him and in serving Him. Service for the Lord. What is it? Maybe it's in stewardship. Maybe it's in finances. Maybe it's in times of prayer. Hundreds of you, I don't know the total at this point, maybe near a thousand in the last couple of weeks have signed a card of commitment that over the next 40 days you will spend specific time every day as a regimen in disciplined prayer and in a section. That's marvelous. But many of you haven't done that. Many of you haven't said, I'm going to make that covenant. I'm going to pray specifically every day. I'm going to have some time of devotion. I'm going to have a holy altar. Maybe early in the morning. Maybe late at night. Maybe when you can't sleep and you have a little insomnia like I do. You'll get up and get on your knees, turn on the light in the family room, go someplace 
and talk to the Lord. Many of you don't do that. You don't have a regular, consistent time of prayer and devotion. Serving the Lord, honoring Him, obeying Him, responding to Him. Let's not make service just food service or the arrangement of the flowers or the ushering or the other staff responsibilities as we see ourselves as ministers, as the servants of this church. But remember that all that you do, whether you eat and drink, you can do to the honor of the Lord. There's nothing sacred for the Christian. Everything is spiritual because we're the servants of Jesus Christ. What is it that you have promised the Lord to do that you haven't done? You're called to be a servant, and servants respond, and they obey. Let's look at two other verses, and we'll conclude. Chapter 7, please. Look at verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, one of the things we're going to learn about the book of uh, Romans is that uh, it's going to demand and stretch us intellectually. And I would suggest of the several months that we're going to be teaching from this book, that you read and reread the book of Romans. Our verse for this week to memorize is Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation. Memorize that verse this next week. And you'll come as we'll find in the weeks to come, some of these passages very, very difficult. And some of the words are used in different ways. For instance, one of those words is the word, the law. Now, we all know the law, the Ten Commandments, and we all know, and the Time magazine refers to that, the 613 different specific laws or rules as to how the worship in the ancient temple was managed. There are, for instance, 543 specific challenges to the Christian in the New Testament. Confess your faults one to another. Pray ye one for another. Deny yourself. Take up a cross and so on. Many rules or laws. And so when we speak about the law of God, we speak about the specific laws that I listed there just briefly. And then the general law of God, the principle that cause us to obedience. Now the word law is used in another way in the book of Romans. It's used as a compelling force. It's used as a restraint. Laws bring you to responsibility or they bring you to restraint. And Paul uses the word law in terms of the restraint or the bondage of sin. Notice the last phrase, the oldness of the letter. The laws in the Old Testament, these very exacting rules, were compelling principles that caused people to do things a certain way. For instance, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You may remember that when the manna came from heaven, two days' worth came on the day before the Sabbath, so they didn't have to gather the manna on the Sabbath day. You remember that there was an injunction not to build a fire on the Sabbath day, so you weren't allowed to gather sticks, and you weren't allowed to walk certain distances on the Sabbath day. And these were all the regulations of the principle of ancient Israel. So the laws restrained, they restricted. And Paul uses this concept in relation to sin. Sin brings us into bondage. Sin is a debilitating capacity. It decreases us. It diminishes us. It brings death. The law of sin and death. It's a destructive force within us. The force of sin. And so he speaks of the law of sin. That debilitating factor that comes out of our nature. But then he speaks about the law of the Spirit of God. A new compelling force. A new thrust. A new dynamism. A new driving principle, a new psyche motivator, the law of the Spirit of God. And he says it's a new law. It's the law of the heart, not the law of the book. The law not of the letter, but the law of the Spirit, the inner desire to please God. So rather than the laws of Moses, we have the laws of Christ. Rather than the laws, the regimen of the letters of the books and the commandments, 
the law of love, the royal law of love. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart. If you did that, the rest wouldn't have to even be repeated. Love the Lord with all your heart. And then, of course, if you do, you love your neighbors yourself. And he speaks about this, to serve in the newness of the Spirit. The prophet said that. The prophet said that God will put his law in the heart. The prophet said, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. The dry bones will come together. You know that great passage. You will operate from the inside out rather than the outside in. The law of the newness of the Spirit. I pray that for this congregation. I pray that we will be motivated by the love of Christ. Paul said that in 2 Corinthians 5.17. The love of Christ should constrain us. It should compel us. It should cause us to live and die for Him. One other passage in the 7th chapter. Would you go down to verse 25? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. One other passage to connect with that. Let's go to Romans 12, please. And look at verse 11. We all know Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. There's the word. Reasonable. It makes sense. You can identify with sin, can't you? We're all sinners. You can remember that irresistible pull that Paul speaks about in Romans 7, the things that I would do I don't do, and the things that I shouldn't do I find that I do. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Thanks be unto God who gives me the victory in Jesus Christ. We all know the law, the principle, the constraining factor of sin and self. Now as believers, we all know the liberation that comes in Christ. Galatians 5.1 if the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. The new spirit that comes in. The new driving dynamism to serve Jesus Christ with love. Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ. I now serve God. And it's my reasonable service because I've presented my body. You see the concept of loving bondage? I have been freed and redeemed from the bondage and the slave market of sin. For the release of the slave always required a payment. And when a slave was purchased, he was redeemed. He was bought with a price. And so the Bible says we have been bought with a price. Jesus Christ has paid in full the price over our head, which was judgment and death and eternal separation from God and all that is good in the lake of fire. We have been redeemed, and the song says, redeemed, redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. I'm free. I'm saved. I'm delivered. I'm a free person. Once and for all, forgiven and exonerated by God. And so, he says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present now your bodies. Go back to the person who redeemed you, who set you free, who paid the price. Go back to the one and say to him, I serve you freely. I love you. You purchased me. You own me. I'm your property. But now I want to serve you, not out of the legal obligation that I belong to you, but I want to serve you because I love you, because I'm indebted to you out of love. I serve you with all of my heart. Because of the mercies of God, I present my body, a living sacrifice, which is my reasonable service. How tremendous that is to present your body. A lot of people want to present their minds. A lot of people want to present their money. A lot of people will present everything but their body. You are your body. We all know you have a spirit. We all know you have a soul. But there's a lot of talk about soul and spirit in church and very little talk about your body. Your eyes, what you look at. Your hands, what you touch. Your feet, where they go. Your elements, all the parts of your body belong to Christ. And Paul writes later to the Corinthians who couldn't get the point and didn't want to when he said, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit 
that was purchased by Jesus Christ. You are not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Slaves had bodies, and their bodies belonged to the master. And so he uses this phrase. He says, now you stand up and you present your body, all that you are, as a living sacrifice to God. Because it's your reasonable service. Because you're a servant of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. There's no higher calling. There's nothing more noble than serving Jesus Christ. And loving every minute of it. Look please then in verse 11. Not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit. There it is. And the phrase is used again. Serving the Lord. Child of God tonight, can you say I'm serving the Lord? You say, does it mean ministry? Does it mean mission field? No, it means that everything you do, you do it as if you were doing it to the Lord. It would make a difference in everything we do. When you talk to somebody, if you would imagine that you're talking to the Lord, you'd never be critical. You'd never be uh, downplaying someone else. You would never say anything that would hurt them. You would be kind and generous with your words. You would encourage. You would build up. You would, as we say, edify. Everything that you said to anybody else, you would say it as if you were saying it to the Lord. Give no place to wrath, the Bible says. Be fervent in spirit. Wouldn't it be great if we talked that way to each other? Many times, you never know who you're talking to. The Bible says many times you are entertaining and having a conversation with an angel and you're not aware of it. Wouldn't it be different if we did this in business? Well, he ripped me off. He overcharged me. I'm going to get him. Boy, the next time I write a contract with him, I'm going to tighten it up or whatever. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every time we did anything in business with somebody else, we would do it as if we were doing it as unto Christ. And even though the person does nail us to the wall, Jesus said, love your enemies and do good to those who despitefully use you. That's in conflict with our culture. But it's Christianity. We're not told to be in correspondence with our culture. Serving the Lord. Doing everything as if it were Christ. And this is the concept, and I'm almost through, with what Paul was telling the saints, particularly at at Galatia. Remember, a lot of the people that are sitting in the congregation, particularly in Rome, are slaves. And he says to them, Slaves, you serve your master just as if you were serving God in heaven. We all want... Slavery to be done away with. And there isn't a single passage in the Bible about the problem of slavery. No, it needs to go to another level. Even though you're being abused. Even though your master is requiring things that are despicable and unreasonable. Serve him as if you're serving the Lord. We can't identify with that, see. We can't relate to that. That's not where we live. But if we could take it to the level of where we live, we'd be different people. In our employment, in our homes, in every contact with all the communication that we have with people in life. If we could say, I do this. I hate every mini of it. He doesn't deserve it. I should not turn the other cheek. I should teach him a lesson. We all feel that we have a right to be vengeful. If we would say, I'm going to do it as unto the Lord. I'm going to do it as if I were doing it for Jesus himself. And Jesus said that. He said, if you give a cup of cold water and you do it in my name, you did it as if you did it to me. No wonder Paul loved this phrase. He didn't feel that he was putting himself down. He was educated at the University of Alexandria. He could speak several languages. He had memorized the first five books of the Bible by heart. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He deserved the best table at the finest restaurants. He had it Heads and shoulders above any other Christian. He said, anything that you know, I know it more. Not bragging, but because he did. And yet he introduces himself to the church of Rome. Because many of them were slaves, and he was too. And he says, Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ. Don't be a slave to sin. Be a slave to righteousness. Don't be a slave to self. Be a slave to God. Be a slave not because you have to or because it says you must do it, but do it 
as a slave to the newness of the Spirit. Don't do it out of the letter of the law, but do it at the highest level at the law of love and be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Ah, there's so much here. Go home tonight with that theme. If you don't remember anything else, go tonight saying, with great joy and with great humility, the highest and most noble calling in life. And this is the way I said this morning, I would really like to be introduced. I didn't have this thought until I studied this passage. A servant of Jesus Christ. He is God Almighty. He is the lover of our souls. He saved us with his never dying love. He deserves it. He wants it. We must give it to him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you are the sheep of his pasture. You are the sons and daughters of God. You are saints, uses the phrase in chapter 1. You're ambassadors. The Bible says you are to be queens and kings at level 2 with God. You are the salt and the light. You are so many things. You're called the brethren. You're said to be in the fellowship. You're called the church of the living God. Many, many phrases and titles relate to the Christian. But I suggest that the foremost and the most prominent might be servants of Jesus Christ. May God help us to serve him with gladness and to honor him in everything that we do. Tonight, tomorrow, and every day more so as we wait for his coming. Thank you for listening. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank thee tonight for thy presence with us, for the joy of this happy and exhilarating music, for all that we share in the fellowship of the gospel, for friends and family, for the visit of Elizabeth Hanford Dole, for the giving of our offerings and the service of God in stewardship, and that we have served Thee by listening to Your Word and seeking again to understand the responsibility as well as the happy requirement of serving Thee. We bow before Thee and honor Thee. We take our role seriously, not with drudgery or in any way feeling that we are pressured to do so, but in a loving and grateful attitude that we're not only saved, but we're saved to serve. And we would sanctify all that we do tonight and the days of this week and say together, we are your servants, O Lord, and we would serve thee gladly and lovingly. May this beautiful vision and this great and high and noble calling of our common relationship with Thee be appreciated tonight. And if we have made vows and promises, if we have seen our tasks and have not risen to them, if we have been disobedient as the sons and daughters of God, we pray that tonight we would make new vows and new covenants and abandon any tendency in our lives to be reluctant, but to be obedient and to serve Thee tonight with all of our hearts. Bless us and teach us from this epistle in the weeks and the months to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.